Uh, thank you to our land use public hearing uh, here at Borough Hall. My name is Melvin Miller. I am the Deputy Borough President. I am stepping in for the Borough President temporarily. She will be here shortly. Um, but uh, we did want to start. Um, we're going to go a little bit out of order today. We're going to start uh, with item number three. And then we're going to go to item number four. If you guys don't mind, you guys ready? Library ready? Yeah. Okay, so we are going to open. The hearing is now open. Calendar item number three. Mueller, number 160247 PPQ. The applicant is Queens Public Library and Park of Citywide Administrative Services. Effective Community Board number seven. Morning. Morning. Yes. Yes, <laughs> that's okay. Good morning, my name is Louis Finkelman. I'm the General Counsel for the Queens Borough Public Library. And I'm here as the applicant uh, for that ULIP application involving the Mitchell Linden Community Library. Um, the library has owned the current location since 2012. Uh, it purchased the property at that time after having to vacate the lease premises that uh, it had been using since 1962. Uh, because of the poor conditions of the prior property, as well as the fact that the uh, landlord had expressed a desire to sell the property uh, for development purposes. So the library purchased the property given the ex exigencies and not having the time uh, to go through a formal process with the city for the city to purchase the property on behalf of the library. Um, the library had paid three and a half million dollars for the condo units and has been using the premises for the community library since that time. Um, transferring title to the city is consistent with a rather old 1907 agreement uh, between the Queens Library and the City of New York in which the structure in Queens is intended to be and um, that the city owns the properties that the libraries occupy. The library is responsible for the support and maintenance of the libraries. So this is fully consistent with, we have 57 libraries that are currently owned by the city of New York. Uh, we have three outliers, two of them are subject of applications today. The third, unfortunately, we haven't obtained funding from OMB uh, to go forward with the transfer of title and reimbursement for the expenses in, in purchasing the property. So that's basically, in some substance, the, the application for Mitchell Linden. Any questions? So I know uh, Board 7 waived the hearing yes. because the building was already in use and purchased by the library. Um, but did, were there any conversations either in committee, um, you get steps from the community board on the support of this? Oh uh, yeah, I can tell you the community board fully supports this. In fact, the reason they waived the hearing is it was their understanding that this had actually been accomplished. The funding was put in place in 2014. Um, I'm with the library less than a year, and when I got here, I made sure this was given a priority to go forward with the ULA process to get this done. Uh, they were actually on the impression this had been done. They fully support uh, the city ownership of this library. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Calendar item number four. <clears throat> Mueller number 160248 PPQ, the applicant Queens Public Library and Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Executive Community Board number 3. Good morning. I'm here in support of this ULIP application as well. Louis Finkelman, General Counsel of Queens Park Public Library. Um, again, this is a uh, community library that uh, we've been operating at the location since 1962. Uh, the library purchased the property in 2012 uh, by virtue of an option that was in the lease at that time uh, that gave the library a right of first refusal if the landlord sought to sell the property. Uh, in 2011, uh, he indicated that he was going to seek to sell the property. Uh, he received an offer of $800,000. The library was given a 14-day period to match that in order to keep a vital community library in service, and the library did, again, with the expectation that at some point in time, much sooner than this, um, the title would be transferred to the city. So it's the same 
agreement that I uh, discussed before. Um, the city is intended to be the title owner of the libraries for a variety of purposes, not the least of which is they're responsible for capital funding and capital construction in the Queens libraries. And quite frankly, we don't want that held up by virtue of an ownership issue. So. And I see the community board fully supports. Yes, I was at the hearing and uh, testified, and they were fully in favor of it. Thank you. Calendar item number two. Calendar item number one, BSA number two zero one six four one three one BC. The applicant Ackerman LLP. Effective Community Board number eleven. Good morning. My name is Lisa Orantia, and I'm. From Ackerman LLP, the Land Use Council to uh, the applicant in this variance case at BSA, and it's filed on behalf of the Divine Wisdom Academy, who's requesting a waiver of maximum permitted floor area for a school. It's a community facility use in an R2A zoning district, and it's to allow <coughs> a minor enlargement. <coughs> excuse me a 4,427 square feet to accommodate an existing enrollment and existing programs. The site is bounded by 245th Street, Northern Boulevard, and Alameda Avenue, and is a zoning lot comprised of three tax lots, 1, 8, and 6, on Block B, 195. The zoning lot is occupied by a school, a church, and a two-story convent. Uh, the school is a not-for-profit community facility. There are 450 students enrolled in pre-kindergarten through eighth grade, and that the ages are from 18 months to 14 years. The zoning lot is not complying currently at its existing uh, square footage. The maximum FAR is 0.5, and they're currently at 0.58. There's a pro programmatic need for this enlargement. Uh, there's a lack of dedicated space for certain programs. Over the last 30 years, there's been an increase in demand for the pre-kindergarten, uh, which includes a pre-dedicated space for band and choir, for faculty meetings, student consultations, lesson plan development, uh, the nursery, gross motor skills, and early reading programs. Uh, there's also faculty and student disruption. Uh, when music classes or foreign language classes are taking place, the teachers have to leave the classrooms and plan lessons and grade work in the hallway. Uh, there, and there's no room to store musical instruments. Um, in addition, there's a limitation on scheduling classes and extracurricular activities. Uh, the school can't maximize use without adequate preparation, performance, office, and classroom space. And lastly, this proposed enlargement will resolve layout problems. Uh, right now, the home rooms double as foreign language rooms. Art rooms are used for band practice. The principal's office is accessed through the supervising principal's office. And the office computer room is not accessible during the student counseling session. So the variance request is a proposed three-story enlargement, and it's going to uh, be located in the courtyard between existing three-story portions of the school. Once enlarged, the school building will be 56,866 square feet on a zoning lot having 0.62 FAR. And again, the maximum is 0.5 FAR. The existing heights, window design, and brick will all match. On the first floor will be a nursery, a meeting room, and a hallway. The second floor will be a music conservatory. And the third floor will have a faculty room and a professional development center. <clears throat> so the application for the increase of FAR is really just to reconfigure the space so that um, you can operate a bit more effectively, or do you anticipate more than increasing? There's no proposed in, uh, increase in enrollment in connection with this variance application. It's only to accommodate the existing enrollment and existing programs. Yeah, um, the community board had concerns about the waste container collection. Can you talk about that? Sure. 
favor. So the community board did vote in favor of the application, but there are some neighbors who have uh, voiced complaints about uh, the existing sanitation pickup, and that doesn't necessarily change because of this variance application, um, except that the dumpster is located in the space of the, where the enlargement is going to occur. Uh, they will have to move the dumpster pickup to somewhere else on the site. The complaint is about the current noise that's happening because of this pickup. Um, our firm has reached out to the Department of Sanitation uh, to talk to them about how uh, the, the uh, dumpster might be relocated on the lot so that it doesn't disturb the neighbors. Um, and uh, we've also consulted with the church for a possible relocation. Uh, but again, this is an existing condition that's, that's not necessarily affected by the application. Yes, we'll have to show that and we'll have to make sure that it's convenient for the department of sanitation. Uh, I, I don't think currently, and I think they want to keep it flexible at this point so that they can decide where best it would be located. I would imagine that the complaints from the residents you know, wherever they live around the school, so logically, I guess, the complaints would be placed somewhere in the world. So I, I guess to, to Irving's point is that, you know, this did come up with the community board as an issue, and you guys were aware of it, um, and I think that there was some conversations about being accommodating to locating the dumpster someplace else. And I think um, you would have hoped that before coming here, there would have been some thought about where on sort of the site map uh, the dumpster would have been relocated. And it seems like there hasn't been. Is that right? I don't think it's been fixed at this point, and we're open to wherever the Department of Sanitation finds it to be most convenient for their trucks. It's not a private part of it, it's the Department of Sanitation. DLS. Yeah. So wherever the Department of Sanitation decides is the best place to go. Right, if, if that's, you know, if, to, if we can accommodate what the residents would like, and at the same time, be in a place that's acceptable to DOS, well, what's that we know? I mean, does the school or church put the dumpster on the sidewalk and the sanitation? I believe the sanitation drives right up onto the lot and they use a machine that uh, lifts the dumpster and empties it and puts the truck. So it's a container, it's not like yes. Correct. So I guess pickup will be dependent on how the truck gets into the system. Right. And we're going to curve that as a curve for I mean, if need be, would there be a new curve cut for you? Because if you look at the site map, mm -hmm. I think there's portions of the site that is um, uh, at a bus, uh, less residential, and if there was an opportunity to locate the dumpsters and the curb cut um, so that there's egress that way, then it would be maybe less disturbance to the residential. Yeah. So is all access to the existing parking lot from down here at I 
All right, well, if you could get back to us on that as well as some thoughts or any follow up with DOS about the government. And you're not calendar is No. And just can you talk a little bit about sort of um, construction schedule and, and disruption or lack of disruption to the rest of the facility? Yeah, I don't have any information on the construction schedule, but I can get that information for you. Timeline. Okay. So we'll get back to the location of the curve question and possible location of the curve. And I guess that would be Good morning, Madam Deputy Borough President. My name is Richard Lovell, I'm from the law firm Sheldon Lovell PC. I'm joined today by George Elliott and Eric Bellinich from the um, owners of the property. And what we have today is a 38th Street and 31st Avenue rezoning. Uh, this rezoning is a relatively small rezoning. It's covering about eight parts of eight lots. And you can take a look at the zoning map to my left. Uh, in the 2010 story rezoning, which rezoned portions of well, entire blocks, rather than two, about 238 blocks, um, this rezoning basically, at the time, respected mid midline boundaries. So as city planning is, is wont to do, they basically ran the rezoning district boundaries through the center of the blocks. What that did on our block is it basically incorrectly divided eight tax lots between uh, the R6B and the R5B zoning district. So you can see that um, these blocks, these lots, these eight, uh, seven lots fronting on 38th Street and one fronting on 31st Avenue all extend to about 140 feet. But the zoning district boundary between the R6B and R5B was basically drawn um, solely at 100 feet, leaving about eight lots with an irregular district boundary. So when we approached the Queens off the Office of the Department of City Planning, we discussed the possibility of extending the R6B to cover the entirety of those lots. And they basically said that they would support this application. They did it as basically a correction of the current condition, something that was correcting an error. Um, and on a practical note, what this means is that there's a slight jog in the zoning district boundary that happens now. So you can see the center line as it exists today through the center line of the block. And after the proposed rezoning, it would be extended an additional 40 feet, so there'd be kind of a slight jog. It would match up with the rear lot lines of the lots on 37th and 38th Street. As a practical matter, this is probably the one of the smallest rezonings we've ever done. And as a further practical <coughs> matter, as far as the additional development, uh, it would really solely be on our site. Our site is about 8,800 square feet. Uh, we have a proposed five-story residential building. It's consistent with R6B. So despite the fact that there's eight lots involved in the rezoning, as part of every rezoning, we have to submit an environmental assessment statement um, to the Environmental Review Division of City Planning. And as a factual matter, they determined that given the square footages of the other buildings on that block, um, no other lots were likely to redevelop. Most of them existed over two, and I know Mr. Porter reached out to discuss this. But most of them, if there's eight lots involved in the rezoning, uh, there are two lots, there's six remaining, four of them existed well over a two, 2.2 to 2.8. So if you rezone them to a two, they're not gonna knock down and redevelop that site. The other two lots are an L-shaped lot 
uh, around the corner and one that fronts on 31st Avenue, um, which you can see in the blue right here as well as lot 81. And those two lots are burdened by cross easements, which were entered against the properties in 2005 and 2006, and basically prevent development of those sites in accordance with the R6B zoning. Uh, and those are recorded, and that was um, discussed both in the materials to the, to the City Planning Commission as well as in the Environmental Review Division materials. So the end result here is a five-story building with 23 units, uh, 12 parking spaces, um, the difference between what can be built right now versus what can be built after the rezoning is very small. It's about an additional 1,600 square feet of lot area, I mean, of floor area, um, and it's it's about uh, two units. So in two or three units, I think we're actually at 20, 23 units. So the number of units is it's a minor number of units. The building looks exactly the same from the uh, front end, uh, from the front, from the street frontage. Uh, and that's why we feel that this is a fairly reasonable rezoning and we you hope know, to get the Queen President's support. Market rate for the following reason: the um, the mandatory inclusionary. Oh, please. I apologize. Thank you. No I'm worries. Sure the deputy borough president representing you all. Very well. Thank you. So to, uh, to answer the question, the um, mandatory inclusionary housing regulations would typically require any upzoning to include uh, affordable units. However, um, when there are fewer than 10 units that are produced um, as a result of the rezoning, uh, the Department of City Planning has determined that such rezonings won't um, require affordable units. So given the fact that an as of right development right now would produce 20 units, and um, even at maximum density, uh, a, a, a development would be able to produce, after the rezoning, 26 units. It fell under the necessary threshold, and so DCP uh, dictated that we not, uh, you know, that we not map an affordable district here. Thank you. I know it's in the material. Not that I'm arguing. Please. But I'm just curious, did the city planning point out any provision in the language? Actually says that? It didn't. Uh, there's the understanding is that the uh, rezoning is producing fewer than 10 units would not be required to do MAH, and between 10 and 25 would be able to waive out. But the, I don't believe those provisions that I know as colonies here yeah. have been yeah. finally determined. Yeah, this is really about the increment uh, in terms of what you can do today. And so yes. maybe you can talk about that when it's done. Uh, okay. Right? Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Uh, and you mentioned more speed. Sure. Um, there's a, a non-profit club that fronts on 31st uh, Avenue here. And um, the cross easements are, um, I'll take it with the specifics, I know that there's um, an easement for a lot on windows, an uh, easement for egress, which, um, when reviewed by the Department of City Planning, there's a determination that um, any construction seeking to build a larger building would impede those easements. So they were satisfied from a factual matter that um, that uh, the lot fronting on 38th Street is not a soft site that it couldn't be redeveloped. And when were these four spaces um, In 2005 and 2006, and I'd be happy to uh, do a separate submission to the to the office to discuss those, and we have them. I think it was just the nature of the relationship between those two lots and um, the sale of the lot on 30, 38th Street. Um, and I know that Casa Delicia, <laughs> which is uh, fronting on 31st Avenue, is a recreational social club um, with members in the area. So 
I don't know the exact legal relationship between the parties that caused them to enter that, but they did record those and those are now gone. I think that, and this was expressed to the Land Use Committee as well, that there's um, homes fronting on the other side, on 37th Street, that um, are long-standing. I think that there was concern over their welfare. I know that the Community Board and the Land Use Committee cited another area of Astoria where the developer had not taken great care and there had been some damage uh, to, the, to the smaller homes in the area. Um, I have, uh, Eric Bellamish and, and George Elliott were with me and were the builders. I've done a lot of work in the community. They built other buildings on this block and have long-standing relationships. And I think that the, um, the comfort level that the land use committee had was such that um, if they conditioned the resolutions, discussing those conditions at the rear, that they would be you know, happy to let them go forward. I also know that while typically 30-foot rear yards are required in a residential district, we actually have 65 feet given the a long depth, we have 140-foot lots. So uh, I think that any disruptions of the homes at the rear, given our 65 feet and the rear yard provided on those homes, is going to be very minimal. But I think that that would probably be the source of some of the uh, some of the votes against. And the line originally drawn in 2010. Again, you might not know this. But why do you think the line was drawn there? I think that if the city planning commission is, is handling 238 blocks, that the easiest thing for them to do is to default to the center line of the block. So, um, and sadly I have this case with other uh, properties in Queens where the, the tax lot and the zoning district lot and the center line don't match up. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's additional work. Uh, I think when we sat down with John Young at our first meeting, he acknowledged that this is more in the nature of a corrective rezoning than an actual, um, you know, an, a meaningful type of rezoning. But that's that's kind of why I think we did it that way. But if I'm reading the map right, the line basically goes like this. Correct. That's the proposed. The tax lot line goes straight down. The tax lot line jumps, and the the zoning district line goes straight down. So what we're seeking to do is to push that zoning district line 40 feet to match the tax lot. Line. I usually find there's a reason for certain oh. things that happen. Yeah. Like I was trying to learn this for a long time. I remember that they knew what we were doing. Um, and so, okay. Well, yeah. maybe we'll ask city planning. Sure. That might be the perfect question <laughs> to ask city planning. Because I really wasn't. So, we appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. 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 It's just a practice. You know, we have these very large facilities, 
blocks, too many blocks, too many blocks. And as a standard normal, it will send you on. Um, and this was one of those. So it's a, it's more of a corrective action in the city of Vegas? Uh, something that reflects what's actually there. So I don't mean to keep you know, so, so from now on, I am going to go under the um, policy that if 10 or less more units, 10 or more units are not created by the, by the uh, rezonings or increases of FAR, that MIH does not take hold. Oh, yes, yes. That That's is the policy, right. wherever it is. That is, that is the test. Um, if it does not create 10 or more units, um, and my agent is So you'll get that text to yes. the other people. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Glad you're here. Oh, thanks. Right. <laughs> thought I walked in right off the queue. I'm too happy about that. <laughs> Item closed and the hearing is closed. The next public hearing will be on June 23rd, 2016. I want to thank Deputy Bro President Miller for putting up the mantle and we will see you all then. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>